Good morning, everybody. Morning. Um, so the text that I've chosen for this morning um, has absolutely nothing to do with this week's parsha. It comes from a, uh, or it's related anyway, to a different parsha entirely, um, and comes from Sefer Mehashiloach, which is the collections of the teachings of the Hasidic Rebbe of Ishbitz in uh, central Poland. And um, the, um, it's, it's a significant work in the sense, uh, both that he's a significant person in Hasidic thought and history, and also in that it's, um, it's a significant work in its own right. The, um, the Ishbitzer Rebbe was, together with the Kotzker Rebbe, a student of Reb Simcha Bonim of Pshischa. And um, after Reb Simcha Bonim's death, when the Kotzker Rebbe took over um, that circle of Hasidim, the Ishbitzer Rebbe was a disciple of the Kotzker Rebbe as well. And then, for reasons that are shrouded in mystery and legend, in 1839, uh, there was a falling out and the Ishbitzer Rebbe left Ishbitz, and the Kotzker Rebbe went into hiding. Um, you know, he remained the Rebbe, but was uh, secluded himself. And, and so many of the stories of the Kotzker Rebbe take place in this period of time where he would uh, come out of his apartment and say something cryptic and terrifying, and then immediately slam the door closed again. Um, and there are many ways in which um, the, mm -hmm. The Ishbitzer Rebbe's approach to Judaism is a reaction uh, to, or even a reaction against, the the harshness that characterized Kotsk. Um, you know, Kotsk was, you know, if if Pshischa was the kind of Hasidut you get when you put a bunch of teenage boys alone together with no adults in the room, um, in terms of its uncompromising rejection of hypocrisy and pretense in terms of its insistence on truth at all costs. Um, you know, Kotsk is what you get when you try to grow up and actually live as an adult and maintain those same standards. Um, a little bit. Um, and the Kotska Rebbe, you know, the Kotska Rebbe used to say slash complain that he wished everyone would go away if he, you know, if there were only 10 true Hasidim in the world that everybody else could go home and stop bothering him. Um, and so what we get with the Ishbitzer Rebbe is, is a, a kind of a, a concern for relationship, a concern for people, um, a sensitivity to the human experience that is reacting to what he left behind in Kotsk. Um, and yet still a, still a sense that there are absolutes in the world, right? And this is not a moderate approach to Jewish living. Um, and the text is, uh, the text is extremely short and the short texts are generally the more difficult ones. Um, so what I'm gonna show first is, um, so he's, he starts with this verse from um, from Vayikra, from Parshat Kedoshim, Lota Ashoket Reacha, do not, you shall not oppress your neighbor, Velotig Zol, uh, nor rob him. Lotalim Pulat Sachir Itcha Ad Boker, the wages of a hired worker shall not remain with you all night until the morning. Um, so, where I'd like to start is uh, to ask everyone. Um, if you could give me like what I'll call a contextual reading, um, what does the first phrase, lo tashoket re'echad, you shall not oppress your neighbor, mean contextually in the verse here? Like, what does the rest of the verse seem to suggest we're talking about? Well, you shouldn't cheat your, cheat your worker, the people who work for you. It's, the 
language sort of reminds me of the Pennsylvania wage payment and collection law. I mean, they're saying you're withholding someone's wages is you're in fact robbing him and oppressing him by stealing the money that he's entitled, he or she is entitled to. Okay, so so there's a, the, both the, um, the withholding the wages and the robbing seem to suggest that the oppression is also some kind of economic oppression. Yes. Um, and anything, anything else that people want to see? Phyllis, is that your hand up? Yes. Uh, I think it's more than just withholding the wages. Oppress means intimidate. You can, a, 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 an employer can not withhold wages, but intimidate the employee, uh, say, if you don't work overtime and not get paid, you're not going to get your wages. There are all kinds of things. Uh, that are forms of intimidation that are not straight stealing from the employee. Okay, so the verse implies a power dynamic as well. There's, a, there's an economic context, as Matt was saying, there's a power dynamic, Phyllis, as you're bringing up, that um, the, the you in the verse here um, seems to have some kind of power or authority over the other, the neighbor, the worker. Um, and Doug, what did you want to add? You're muted, Doug. I can't, we can't hear you. Okay. The, um, the thing that struck me was the word neighbor. Um, because the, when you talk about context, um, and you were talking about that power relationship, that word is a reminder that, that we're all part of the, that both the, the, um, uh, the owner of the field or of the economic activity and the people working for him are are part of the same community. Um, they are not they are not in, in different spaces sociologically. They're they're together. Okay, great. And this is and this is one of the big tensions of Sefer Vayikra, the book of Leviticus. Is on the one hand, it is the book of the Torah that is most concerned with um, the status of the priests and the kind of um, functional hierarchy of Israelite life with the, the priests as a special caste and the Levites. Um, and at the same time, particularly in the second half of the Book of Vikra, which is where this verse comes from, um, it, is the v it is the book with the, the most radically egalitarian vision of society. Right, you know, this is, this is the book of the Torah that gives us the jubilee in which all land reverts to its original ownership every 50 years, and uh, the Shemitah in which no one cultivates and all loans, debts are forgiven, and everyone lives together off the land, you know, worker and, and boss together. Um, Right. And so there's, um, so there's, I think both of these things are here, um, right? There's a, there's a power dynamic and there's a, an attempted corrective to the power dynamic of the verse saying, even if you are the landowner, even if you are the boss, you're no better than uh, the worker, than the neighbor. Uh, Natalie, you wanted to say something also about this? Yes, I love that um, in Judaism, throughout, it talks about, you know, when I saw neighbor, that's the one word that jumped out at me. And I immediately think of love your neighbor as yourself. So I, that's what in the context here is the bottom line is if we all live like that, the world would be a great place. It really doesn't matter about the wages or anything else. Right, although what's interesting there, right, is that the Torah tells us to love our neighbor as ourselves and still tells us to pay the neighbor on time. Um, well, you want to be paid in time, yeah. Right, so, but in other words, like, it's, not that, it's not that the wages don't matter, right? And those, both of these things on some level matter to the Torah. Um, and something that I, I think about always when this comes up is um, Rabbi Shai Held's uh, point that the Torah's instruction to love the neighbor has nothing to do with feelings. 
right? The Torah is not interested in whether or not we have warm, amiable feelings for the people in our lives, that the, the love that's commanded in the verse, and I, I send you to uh, Rav Shai's book, The Heart of Torah, to see in detail kind of how he lays this out. Uh, but what he develops there is that the love that the Torah is talking about, um, and it's only a couple of verses after this, so it's not only just, you know, is the Torah talking about it, but it's all in one passage here. Um, that love is, is a behavior and an activity, not a feeling. But that's how I always translated it. What's that? Love your neighbor as yourself. That's how I always translated it. That is, that is what the word, that is how the words translate. Um, but, but Rav Shai's point, and again, I think, you know, look in the heart of Torah in the second volume um, is where he develops this. Um, the word ve'ahavta means you shall love. Um, but the love that is talked about there is is love as acted out in the world, not love as felt in your heart. Um, and that's, you know, and that, I, I bring that up because I think it's gonna be important for the rest of our conversation this morning too. Um, because the Ishbitzer Rebbe is gonna do something surprising now with, with this verse. Um, so he begins the teaching, Lo tashok et reecha, you shall not oppress your neighbor that is, any good thing that a person could provide to his friend, but he does not provide it, is considered oshek oto, oppressing him. Any good thing that a person could provide to his friend, but he does not provide it, is considered oppressing him. So does that include love, caring? Is that about with the heart also? So what do you think, Natalie? Does I do. it? I do. Okay, so Natalie, you, you're gonna include emotional responses as well as, as practical hands-on responses in what um, this, um, this good thing, this Devar Tov that he's talking about, you're, you're ready to expand that into the emotional realm. Because I think society, society today, when we, you know, it's easy to say, love your neighbor as yourself. But to me, that encompasses everything. Because if we treat each other with respect, I mean, to me, that's part of love. When I say love, I don't mean I have to be in love with somebody. But if I, care about somebody and treat them how I want to be treated. That's the bottom line, to just care about people. What does ahava mean besides love? Is that the only word? Well, it means, it means love, um, but it's, you know, there, there are questions of context. The, the, if you look in, I wish Susan was still on the call. Um, if you look in ancient Near Eastern, like Mesopotamian and, and Akkadian and Hittite documents, um, the word, the cognate word for ahava shows up in those contexts um, describing the relationship of loyalty between a, a vassal and an overlord um, in treaties, in formal treaties between kingdoms. Um, so, you know, so that gives us some sense of context. Um, but you also see, again, like if you look, um, it's worth after this, take a chumash and just read through Vayikra chapter 19, where this, um, this is verse 13, uh, love your neighbor as yourself is, is verse 18, um, right? You know, there's a passage here in which love appears in the context of a bunch of other things, largely economic justice, not in not exclusively. Um, you know, and if you're and if you're really feeling bold, I would say um, if you're feeling bold and you have a concordance, um, to look up um, ahava in the concordance, um, because ultimately, right, the the word means the word means the way the Torah uses it. 
um, whatever you know, kind of meaning it might have in cognate languages, or if you looked in a dictionary or in modern Hebrew, um, you know, I think what's, what's of interest in your question is, what does the Torah mean when the Torah uses that word? Um, as opposed to other kinds of words that could be used to describe affection or loyalty or um, kinship. Um, Art, did you want to say something? Um, <laughs> I don't know how you knew I was thinking something, but um, yeah, I I, um, I think this sets the bar pretty high, and and I, in a sense, almost unreasonably high because I don't think I don't think everyone is tuned in to what other people need, and I don't think that's. Uh, that makes someone a bad person. I think it just makes somebody not as sensitive to someone's needs as other people might be. And uh, I think to say, to call it um, oppressing someone is maybe a little harsh. Yeah, so, um, yeah, the first thing I'll say- I agree with, I agree with Art. Okay. Um, it, the, equiv the equivalent of an act I mean, we think of oppression normally as an act of commission, and we think of the withholding of something as an act of omission. Um, and the equivalence here um, sets a pretty high standard. Yep. Especially when you want to define what a devar tov is, a good thing. Mm -hmm. A good thing could be all your possessions. I mean, if my next door neighbor needs a car, do I have to give him my car? Otherwise, I'm impressing him. Well, you might have to give him a ride, Chaim. Uh, you know, what strikes me too is that um, <clears throat> we always say what we consider the equivalent of the golden rule is that which is hurtful, that which you consider hurtful, don't do it to your neighbor. Uh, and this seems to take an opposite approach. Um, you know, because we say, uh, you know, by being in the negative, it's much more demanding, you know, so don't do something if you don't want to have it done to yourself. And here he's saying, hey, go and do whatever you can or whatever you think and, uh, and, and go at it. And I, I, to me, is a little bit of a contradiction. Yeah, I mean, so, so, so the first thing I'll say um, is when I start hearing words like um, unreasonably high standard, uh, extreme. I'm trying to remember Art, exactly the words that you used, uh, but when I hear things like that, um, it, it confirms that we are definitely dealing with a text, uh, with a teaching from this Pshischa Kotsk Ishbitz tradition, right? I mean, you know, if, if ever there were a group of rabbis who were radically uncompromising in their approach to life, it was them. So, so it's a fair critique um, in the sense that the, the standards to which they held themselves and, and therefore held everyone else were extremely and uncompromisingly high um, and they didn't make many friends that way. Um, you know, the flip side is there's a teaching of the Zohar, which, um, which the, the Ishbitzer Rebbe and his descendants will quote from time to time, um, that a person's moral responsibility extends as far as your awareness, right? So in that sense, Art, what he may be talking about here is, I mean, I, he, I think the Ishbitzer Rebbe would be willing to give you a pass if you were not able to perceive the other person's needs. Right, like, it, like if you if you didn't intuit someone's need, you're not responsible for addressing that need. I think what he's more likely to be talking about here is what happens when you are aware of that need and you choose not to address it. Um, and you know, and to Mort's point, right, Hillel's standard in the Gemara is um, as long as you aren't doing harm to someone else, you're basically okay. Right, you don't have, Rebecca whispers, it's a pretty low standard, right? So, so here we have on the one hand, like a very kind of lowest common denominator standard. At a minimum, we should expect every human being to not harm any other human beings. 
Um, that's a ba that's a good baseline. And at the other extreme, you have the Ishbitzer Rebbe saying, if you haven't done all the things you're capable of doing, you know, and again, Chaim, to your point, like if you also need your car, then you're not capable of giving your car to your neighbor who needs a car, right? Because you need the car, but you are potentially you're capable of giving him a ride if it's somewhere in the direction that you're going to. Um, right, but the Ishbitzer Rebbe is going to say, if you're not doing all of the things that you're capable of doing, then, then you're oppressing. And, and it is, and it is a high standard. Um, and it, and it is uncompromising in a way that is characteristic of, of his approach to Jewish life and moral exploration. I think though, many times I'll speak for myself. I mean well, but I hurt somebody's feelings. I mean, we're imperfect human beings. So even though I think I'm doing something nice, and I think the piece of it is also recognize that we are imperfect human beings and how can we uh, make amends or, you know, clean it up as quickly as we can. And guess what? Sometimes we can't. And what is the thing if you apologize three times and if somebody doesn't accept your apology? You know, so like that gets complicated too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now, now what's interesting that you bring up is I, I'm not sure that there's anything in the Ishbitzer Rebbe's teaching on this point that suggests that the, that the neighbor needs to even be aware of what it is that you have done. Right? And if we just, if we go back to, um, I'm just pulling up the language of the text again, any good thing that a person could provide to his friend, but he does not provide it is considered oppressing him. Um, and now he goes on. And even a prayer that a person could pray on his friend's behalf, but he does not pray is considered oppressing him. As we find with Samuel who said, moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you. And the Talmud explained this as meaning that anyone who could pray on his friend's behalf, but does not pray is considered a sinner. So if you want it uncompromising, here you go. We, we have now firmly left the realm of behavior um, because, because even my ability to pray on someone else's behalf, if I don't make that prayer, I've, I've committed, I've sinned against this verse of oppressing others. Are you? If you're, if you're aware, if you're aware of the need for prayer is what you're saying. You, you're, you're adding that element of awareness. I, I, think it's, I think it's fair to say what he's talking about. I, I think it's fair to say that he's not talking about that you're not praying for all of the needs that you don't know that another person has. I mean, I think that that's, that's, that's like too, that's too far. And, and I think, and you know, and here, I mean, this is a little bit unfair of me to say, but like, Having, having sat for years with these texts, that would be uncharacteristic of the, West, the rest of the way that he thinks about things. I mean, I think we must be dealing with a situation in which you could be reasonably expected to be aware of the need. And if you're not aware of the need, it's because you're closing your eyes to it, not because you're constitutionally incapable of perceiving it. And I say this as somebody who's not like really good on picking up on subtleties of other people's moods or or catching hints or any of that kind of a thing. Um, I think you know I think he's making an allowance for that that not everybody is going to be delightfully intuitive about everyone else's needs. But I I do I mean I I certainly have been in situations where I've been aware that somebody has a need and I just didn't want to deal with it. So so the the result of this is that people who are more tuned into people's needs 
have a higher standard imposed on them than is imposed on other people? Um, no, I think people who are, people have the same standard regardless of how aware of other people's needs they are. The people who are more aware of other people's needs might end up with more to do. Rabbi, can I ask for a clarification on, yeah. on the word? Yeah. So I'm, I'm curious to know how intentional the choice of the word friend is and what is the significance of it? Uh, yeah, so... So the friend, you know, so friend here is my choice in translation because the Hebrew shifts from rea to chaver. Um, like if we look back at the verse lo tashok at reecha, right. um, exactly. is the, that's the language of, of the verse. But the Ishbitzer Rebbe uses the the I would say more. I mean, he wasn't speaking modern Hebrew, but the, it's the more contemporary chaver than um, than rea neighbor. And I don't. What what I can't answer is whether those words would have been synonymous for him, and one would have just been ar like archaic, so he didn't use it, um, or whether there's some kind of intentional shift in meaning that he's trying to give us. Um, it's it's entirely plausible that um you know th those two words meant the same thing to him and he simply used the word that felt more familiar than the word that felt more old-fashioned if if it is intentional and there is a distinction this is a whole different conversation then well what would so where would the where would the difference or the distinction be because the obligation is only to the people who are closest to you. And you'd have to explore what the significance of that is. Yeah, although you can play the same game with Rea. Um, you know, if you look in the Midrashim, there are Midrashim that want to read Reecha, your neighbor, as limiting the circle of concern. And there are multiple verses that use Rea. Um, there's a set of, there's a stream of Midrash that wants to read Rhea as limiting the circle of concern to people who are like you, right? Meaning um, Jewish people and eventually even more narrowly as observant Jewish people. Um, and there is there are streams of Midrash that want to read that ex expansively to say, you know, your, your Rhea, your neighbor is your fellow human being, is the person who is in proximity to you. Um, I think across the board, everyone recognizes that it's morally appropriate for us to have more concern for people who are like us in religion or ethnicity or nationality than people who are unlike us. And, and morally reasonable for us to have more concern for people who are physically closer to us than people who are physically distant for us. Um, right, you know, like, I mean, I just think about like Rebecca and I, like our charitable giving goes to Jewish causes and to Philadelphia causes, almost entirely. Um, and, and that's a reasonable thing. And it's reasonable that if you were gonna be, you know, trying to help people who are struggling financially, that you would wanna first help your siblings and your cousins before you help people who are outside the family. And that, you know, you might be much more inclined to support JRA or Mitzvah Food Pantry or Fill Abundance than to support an organization that's working to combat hunger in Africa. Um, not that we shouldn't be concerned for hunger in Africa, um, but it, it's, it's morally reasonable for a person to say, if people are hungry in Africa and people are hungry in Philadelphia, I'm going to first want to address the hunger that's in my own community. Rabbi Stone, uh, in his Musar class, uh, teaches that we need to bear the burden of the other, starting with the closest other and working outward. Yeah, that's right. And that, you know, and, and you know, Musar puts its own twist on that, but they're getting that from, they're getting that from within the tradition. Um, but I think, you know, if you look, 
if you look at other schools of moral philosophy, you're going to find something similar. Um, I think it's it's just reasonable to say there are concentric circles of obligation, um, and it can't be the case that I have the same level of obligation to a person on another continent who I've never met that I have to a person in my own country that I've never met, that I have to a person in my own city that I've never met, that I have to a blood relative. So, they can't be, those can't be equally weighted. Janet, yes. On the other hand, like the highest level of giving is when you and Rebecca are dating and they don't really get it. Ah, so, so Adelia is raising that in Maimonides' hierarchy of tzedakah, the highest level is where you don't know who the recipient is and the recipient doesn't know who the donor is. Um, but Odelia, in that case, if I give my money to fill abundance, I know that I am helping address food insecurity in Philadelphia, but I don't know who is receiving the aid and the person receiving the aid doesn't know who I am. Right, so, so, so Maimonides, when Maimonides wants that double blind Sadaka, um, he, he's, still, and, and he will explicitly allow for these circles of concern that your family comes first and then the Jewish people in your own city and then the Jewish people elsewhere and then the, the general public in your city and then the general public elsewhere. I mean, I don't think anyone was thinking of global philanthropy in Maimonides' day. Um, but, but, you know, Maimonides in his desire for double blind philanthropy uh, is still allowing for these spheres of moral interest. Rebecca, what did you want to say? So my question about, about the, the previous text is what happens when you're, and that's because this is what's on my mind, what happens when a whole society wrongs a population? And then how does that Right. So, so that was on my mind. Uh, Rebecca's question is, is what do we do with this text in a situation in which a, a society or the structures of a society have injured a segment of the population, kind of as a, as a class, a whole scale um, oppression of a segment of the population. Um, and that was on my mind when I chose this text because I saw we were at the we were at the mar the protest march on Saturday and and I saw a sign that I think the Ishbitzer Rebbe would have really gotten behind. Um, there was a young woman carrying a sign that said, "Privilege is when you think something isn't a problem because it's not a problem for you." A privilege is when you think something is a problem because it's not a problem for you. Um, and, and, I, and, and for me, seeing that sign resonated with this teaching of the Ishbitzer Rebbe. Um, because part of what he's asking, or to come back to your point about people who are more or less um, sensitive to the needs of others, Part of what the Ishbitzer Rivi is asking is for us to engage in the necessary work to increase our sensitivity. Um, and I think part of what he's saying and part of what that sign is saying and part of what so many of us are saying is, um, you know, the old adage, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. I could uh, take Rebecca's hypothetical one step farther where, you know, we're, we're asking about helping people who are not like us um, and maybe are not, um, don't live near us. And what about animals? Um, because, I, I mean, I, I, from what you're saying and from what I'm, I'm reading here, I, it seems to me that that one should not be donating to the SPCA until one has attended to the needs of, of every other segment of humanity that, that is in need. Um, where, am I, where am I getting that wrong? Um, I don't know that you are. I mean, the, you know, um, 
There, there are many critiques of this, and some of them are good critiques, but the general attitude of traditional Judaism has been um, that human beings are existentially distinct from the rest of the animal kingdom, and we do have a different level of concern for human beings than we do for animals. Um, and as I said, like, there's suitable critique there, um, you know, and, and, and let it be said that um, all of the sources have always condemned in no uncertain terms animal cruelty. Um, you know, and, and, the, and early in, um, early in Yoridea, there's a whole list of things that, you know, you're not allowed to do to animals because it's considered cruel. Um, you know, that said, we're not vegans. So, you know, people have farm animals and you harness those farm animals and you make them drag a plow around and you milk them and you take the eggs and you shech them and you eat the meat. And, I, I, you know, um, so in that sense, there's a willingness to use animals in a way that we wouldn't use human beings. Um, and there's a, a widespread, though not universal, sense in the traditional sources that human beings are just different than animals. And if we feel like we should do more for people than we do for animals, um, you know, again, the, the kind of the traditional Jewish moral philosophy would say, yeah, right. We do have, in the same way that I have a higher obligation to a family member than a non-family member, and I have a higher obligation to a Jew than to someone from any other ethno-religious category, and I have a higher obligation to a resident of Philadelphia than to any other American citizen. Uh, you know, the traditional Jewish thinking says I have a higher obligation to my own species than I do to other species. Um, and as I say, like there, there are modern critiques of that and some of them are, are good critiques that need to be over time synthesized into the broader Jewish thinking. Um, but, you know, if you're reading this, that he's saying we should be more concerned for people than animals, he probably would agree to that. And probably would have thought that that was obvious and didn't need saying. It, it strikes me that this is a um, significantly non-utilitarian view of, of ethical behavior. Yeah. But say more. Well, I mean, the, the notion behind utilitarianism isn't uh, how how you are um, sociologically or, or physically connected or in proximity, uh, but in what action is going to create the greatest good for the greatest number. And that's a whole different yardstick and a whole different way of looking at the world. Yeah, and it's a and it's a problematic yardstick on in some moral dimensions because you know you could look at it and you could say well the the economic structures that have um, denied black people the ability to accumulate the kind of wealth that even lower middle class white people have been able to accumulate has, you know, maybe that has created the greatest good for the greatest number of people, but it's created immense suffering for a large number of people. Um, I, again, my understanding of enlightened self-interest would suggest that, I mean, there, there are circumstances where um, sacrifice is required, but taking a long view, I, I, that particular argument, I think would be hard to substantiate. Hard to substantiate in what sense? In the sense that you don't think it's the greatest, it's the greatest good for the Well, I, I, I mean, I understand, I understand the example, but I would suggest that that, that doesn't, that doesn't, um, that doesn't result in the outcome that you're suggesting, that, that you're really creating the greatest good for the greatest number. Uh, if anything, uh, if you look at the, at, at some of the, the most fundamental issues confronting the world right now, um, looking at the coronavirus, looking at the environment, they do require a global view rather than a local view. Yeah, 
Yeah, I think, I, I think yes. Yeah. I think, I guess I, I meant only to, to kind of illustrate the, that there are some limits to util, you know, in, depending on the, the frame of the question, the, the utilitarian approach to, to morality allows that the greatest good for the greatest number could still be bad for a smaller number of people. It Absolutely. It's, it's suggests of nothing else. Altruism uh, it has a role to play. Yeah. And I, you know, and I, and I think what's being presented here is absolutely contrary to the utilitarian view that says, no, I mean, what we need to be concerned about here, um, what we need to be concerned about here is about being diligent in addressing the our awareness of the needs of others, right? I mean, there was some, um, I didn't actually get to read the article, but there was like an op-ed headline in the New York Times on Sunday. What if there had been no video of George Floyd? All right, and, and it's one of the things that when you, um, you know, if you've, if you've been to Montgomery and if you've been to the National Monument for Peace and Justice, like, I mean, you know, white cops have been killing black people for 150 years with impunity, right? There's, there's absolutely nothing new happened two weeks ago in Minneapolis. What's new is that the rest of us got to see it. And, and I think that even part of what, um, what the Ishbitzer Rebbe is, is speaking to here is not only, I don't, I don't know that he's only imposing an obligation on us to act, but I think he's giving voice to there's something in us that can't unsee certain things, right? And if you think about what it's meant that we have these videos of police brutality against people of color, or um, I was thinking about this, um, if, um, if you've seen the article from 2014, Ta-Nehisi Coates, The Case for Reparations, there were things I read in that article that I couldn't unread. Like my world changed and I became aware of structures of injustice that had been around me all my life, but now I saw them for the first time. Um, and, and what the Ishpitzer Rebbe is, is raising for us is once you see those things, Your, your, any claim to moral existence depends on your then getting up and doing something about it. What was the, can you repeat what you read? Um, I'll, yeah, I can put it in the chat box. It's an article called The Case for Reparations. Um, you know what, I can probably, um, well, I'm just gonna put it in here. It's Ta-Nehisi Coates, the case for reparations. Um, if you Google the case for reparations, it'll come up. It was in the Atlantic and it was a really like a kind of a bombshell of an article. Um, and be because of, I think just his like, his, the, the thoroughness of his evidence for the case that he was making. Um, but you know, but you can use your own example. I think we've we've all. It's hard for me to imagine that you've reached this point of adulthood, and there hasn't been a time where you encountered something and you said, "Now that I know this, I can't unknow it." Um, and I think you know, our, on some level, where he's applying the uncompromising standard is to say, "You may wish that you could unknow this thing." but you can't, you don't get to push it out of your mind. You can't go back to pretend, you can't pretend that you don't know what you know. That's if you know it. Yeah, I, I, I really believe that all of this has to be that, that you know it. 
Like it can't, it can't be the case that we're morally responsible for acting on needs that we're not aware of. It's, it's kind of the opposite then of the idea of ignorance of the law is no excuse. Here, ignorance is kind of an excuse. Yeah, well, I think, well, again, I, ig ignorance is different than unawareness. Um, are you, are you, are you go ahead. What, like in the sense that like, if you're driving a car, we can reasonably expect that you have caused yourself to know all of the relevant laws to, draw, to operate that car. Right, and a license is supposed to attest. I'm reading, in, the last time I got a license, I took a test, and like a written test, and I had to indicate that I knew how, how the law of the road worked, right? So then to say like, oh, I didn't know that you can't drive through a red light is no excuse because there's a negligence in that ignorance of the law because we had a reasonable expectation that if you didn't know how a traffic light worked, you would find out before you drove the car. Um, that's different than being unaware. Um, well, okay. I, I think it's, it's, diff it's different than being unaware because I don't think we have a reasonable expectation that everybody should know everything about everybody else or that we even could find out. But again, it gets back to the point that some people um, are just more aware than others. And, yeah. and some, people, some people are more aware than others. And some people make choices to live in homogenous neighborhoods where they don't encounter racial diversity and where whatever problems might be encountered by people other than them are invisible to them. Right, and 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 th and and that's a place where I think the Ishbitzer Rebbe might start to take exception and to say, it's one thing to be unaware of someone else's troubles; it's another thing to have set your life up in a way that you won't have to see them. But so many of us do that without knowing that we're doing that. I mean, that's not a always a conscious choice. Right, it's not always. Make all kinds of decisions about where you live. Right. It's it's not always a conscious choice. Um, you know, and I argue that about where we live. Mm -hmm. um, but again, I think there's but there's an element of this conversation, Rebecca, like in our in the conversation we had on Saturday morning about taking the kids and going up to the protest that was happening up by the art museum. Um, we didn't have to go even when we saw a ton of people streaming up 22nd Street, we, we didn't have to go and we chose to make ourselves aware. Yeah, I, I guess I'm just saying that like, again, because of, just the way, because of the way that America is set up, because of all kinds of reasons, because of zip codes and taxes, um, society, our society has made it such that it is challenging to live, to truly live in a And you can read about that the, the color of law, just the way that it's hard for people of color to get a, to get a mortgage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think maybe the difference, I think, I think maybe the difference would be the difference between, I mean, I'll just speak about this personally, the difference between kids, can you guys please stop yelling? Stay up there. You stay up there. I think the difference is, the difference between my awareness of issues of racial justice in America now and the moral obligation that that places on me to be present, stand up and take action and the lack of awareness that I had even 10 years ago, um, which was, 
which was not because I didn't want to know, but because it wasn't, it wasn't present for me. And I think, you know, again, like at the point at which it's on TV and in the newspaper and in conversation, um, I think, you know, for a person living in a major urban area or the suburbs around it today to say, I didn't know that the laws were stacked against people of color are like, that's the ignorance that's no excuse. Um, you know, to say, I only just got involved in activism because until now I didn't see that it was an issue is a different kind of a thing. There's a, there's, there's a threshold line of awareness that, that has to be crossed before all of this comes into being. Clearly, yeah, I don't, I don't disagree with that. I think there are some things that everybody ought to know and ought to be responsible for knowing. Uh, I'm thinking more of the, the more subtle things, uh, the more private, personal things that people, uh, some people are tuned into and other people aren't. Uh, somebody uh, suffers a loss. Um, you know, a young person uh, might not, might not be tuned in to what that person what that person needs now some people might be others might not be i think it's um again it's 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 relevant it's uh, some people are sensitive other people are not so sensitive yeah and i think and again i think what the ishbitzer rebbe would want you to hear is is twofold one is that we are all as sensitive as we are. And he can get away with putting forward such an uncompromising standard because the arbiter of this is you. Or there, there is no objective observer who can say, Art, you are aware of the following seven things, but you're only doing anything about five of them, and therefore you are sinning. I mean, like it, it, it has to be the case that only that the self is the only, well, God and the self are the only two capable judges of this. Um, and the other thing that he would want you to hear in this is that however sensitive you are to the needs of others, you have a responsibility to increase that sensitivity. Whether you are a highly sensitive person or whether you are kind of emotionally dull, um, you should be working to grow that. And, and again, like with all of this being an internal standard and an internal process, your growth is relative and right. And, and I think it's true that he is placing higher expectations on people who are more highly evolved. Um, I, I think, you know, in general, that's a reasonable position to take. I have a different standard of behavior for my 12 year old than I do for my eight year old than I do for my five year old. There are things that I will let the five year old slide on that I won't let the eight year old slide on. I just, I mean, I'm like looking at the breakfast table, right? Like the table manners, let's pick a really mundane, uncontroversial thing. We have different standards of table manners for five year olds, eight year olds, and 12 year olds. we still expect each of them to live up to the highest standard of decorum for their age. And I think the same is true for emotional maturity, right? Like every single one of us is at a different place in our ability to sense and address the needs of others. But what he's saying is you have no excuse to slack off relative to your own ability to do that. Right. I, I think that that's the, I think that that's what he's, what he's saying here, Art, is, you know, if you are a highly sensitive person, you have to respond with a high sensitivity. If you are a less sensitive person, you still have to respond with maximum sensitivity for your abilities. <clears throat> so... Abe, do you remember yeah. um, this thing in Brachot that said like there are two, 
it was like a, 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 a rabbi and the son was sick and the wife says to him, you know, go to so-and-so because so-and-so oh, is the praying rabbi. And then there was the other rabbi that was the head of the academy. And it was like set up for me, like even among rabbis, there's rabbis that are like intellectual. And then there's rabbis that are always praying all the time. Do you remember that? Um, vaguely, and I don't, I can't remember where, but, but yes, I think you're a hundred percent right, right? Like not every, right? We have different types because not every type is the right type for the, for every situation. And, and so he says, well, you know, why me? And he said, she says, cause you're always in the court of the King cause he's always praying. So right. God is used to seeing him. So choose him to pray for your child. Yeah, I mean, Labdell used to say this to people, um, you know, I mean, I still say this to people, right? You know, people say, well, like, wouldn't you want a doctor to do the circumcision, like, you know, in the hospital with the doctors? And it's like, no, you don't want the doctor. You want the guy who does 500 verses a year. <laughs> <laughs> You absolutely, without a doubt, want whichever Moyle has the highest volume, right? Because, because he's the expert, because he knows what he's doing. And not just that he knows what he's doing, but he, he, his hands know what they're doing. I'd never mind, and this has been, I, I heard this from uh, Rabbi Ed Feinstein, who was um, Valerie, my teacher in rabbinical school, but um, this has subsequently been confirmed for me by a number of medical professionals. Uh, the hospital circumcisions are done by first year residents at the end of their overnight shift. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, the, the Moyle got a good night's sleep at home with their spouse and then showed up at your house the next morning at a convenient hour. So, um, but you know, but I think it, but yes, I think it's that, right? Like there are, there are different types and like, and I'll be honest, right? Like I'm not an activist type. That's never been my, comfortable space. Um, and I pushed through that on Saturday because we had to be there, um, because it mattered to be there. Um, so I think it's, I, so I think it's both things, right? I mean, I think that there are, there are always some of us who are going to just naturally, right? That, like there are rabbis out there, including congregational rabbis who are just more naturally activists than I am. Um, and part of what I, part of what the Ishbitzer Rebbe is saying to me is there are times where you have to push past whatever your type is and be the type that the moment is asking for. Yeah. Right, because every rabbi has to be the praying rabbi sometimes. Right, and, and in that, and in the story that you're talking about, when it's in this like, moment of crisis where the child is dying it's like well go get the biggest big gun you can find um you know and then there are moments where um it's just a very long doorbell um then there are moments where like there are moments where you go out and get the specialist and there are moments where you look around, um, you know, it, like it says about, um, it says about Moshe Rabbeinu when he killed the Egyptian taskmaster. Um, it says, Vayar ko vako vayar ki ein ich. He looked left and right and he saw that there was no man. And the Medr says about that, Moshe's moment of awareness when he kills the taskmaster and defends the slave came because he looked around and he saw that there was nobody else who was going to act. Vayarki um, Right? And, and, you know, and so how does, I mean, this is like one of these, I've been thinking a lot about Moshe because of um, this Shabbos, I'll have a lot to say about Moshe on Shabbos morning. Um, but like, how does the pampered prince become the revolutionary liberator. Because that wasn't his type. Right? He wasn't raised to be a firebrand. He wasn't raised to be a revolutionary. He was raised in the very center of the power structure. Right? He was the, the heir apparent to the status quo. 
right? And that's something I think Prince of Egypt gets very, very right. The movie Prince of Egypt gets very, very right about this. Um, right, but the Medrash says, Vayarki and Ish, like, he had to become, he had to be the person that the moment required, even if that wasn't what his natural type was. Right? And so, so Art's right, like we're not all equally sensitive to the needs of others. Um, and some people are natural carers. And some people have to learn to be carers. And some people, some, well, at some point, we all find ourselves in a situation in which we have to be that person because no one else is there to do it. We have to be who no one else can be in that situation. And, and, and yeah, that's a high standard. Um, and it's, and it's, I think it's part of what w is being asked of us in this moment. I mean, if we think about like, well, what does it actually mean to speak or to stand for racial justice in America at this moment? Um, Your justice, can you stop doing that? Please? Justice is going to need a lot of us to take actions that are not in our own self interest. I mean, I remember this maybe a sense of like, you know, my own. Journey. I probably would have identified myself as libertarian in high school. And I found myself the other day saying to someone that it's clear to me how we resolve the unrest that we're seeing in America right now. And it's reparations, single payer health care, and a universal basic income. Now, we're not going to get those things without a lot of people making decisions that are going to be better for society, but much worse for them personally. Um, including me, honestly. I, I don't know that single payer healthcare is going to be better for me than the insurance I already have. But I, I, I can't anymore look at the world and think about myself and not be able to see the experience of Black Americans that I've become aware of in the way that I've become aware of it now. Yesterday, I was driving down uh, Broad Street from Philadelphia to Elkins Park to pick up a, a package at a friend's house in Elkins Park. And I witnessed a bike accident. Mm. It was a bunch of African Americans. The guy hit the ground and it was right where Beth Shalom used to be that's now a church. Mm -hmm. And uh, because of I'm aware right now, I parked my car, got out of the car, ran across the street. There was another white woman in a Prius who also stopped. She had called the ambulance. I asked the guy his name. He told me his name. And I said, I'm going to stay with you till the ambulance comes. It looks like he had dislocated his shoulder, might have asked him his name. Um, and what day it was. Did he know what day it was? And I waited with him till the ambulance came. Every cars were going by looking. But it was interesting. It was me and this other white woman in a Prius and another guy who had run out of a medical building, a black guy who said he was the, uh, ran this medical facility right there. And I said, can you take his bike? And I said, because I don't think we're going to be able to get it in the ambulance. Can you get him a cart? So it was like this whole thing of orchestration. I didn't realize how scared I was until last night when I got home mm. from after going to Elkins Park, but that's something I wouldn't have done. I would have thought, oh, someone else will do it. Yeah. Someone else will stop, but they didn't. The group of people at Sid Booker's Fried Shrimp were still there buying their stuff across the street. Cars were going by. And that is how this whole thing has made me aware. No, I am high of for that. Um, I saw it 
I've got to be with that person until he gets in that ambulance. Then I called the hospitals. I found he was at Temple, not Einstein. And I found out he was discharged, made me feel better. Yeah, I feel like I want to be like Malamed's hood on the people who are driving on Broad Street, that maybe because they saw you and the other woman, they knew that they didn't need to stop. <laughs> um, right, but, but for sure, there was a period of time in which some people passed by, you know, and, and to Art's point, some of the people who passed by didn't even see that there was a person in need. I mean, he hit the ground, he was in the middle of the street. Yeah, it's harder to miss. Yeah, it's hard. Although, you know, I don't know, these days with people on their phones, I, you know, it's a, right, you know, and it's a hard thing. It's like, how do I first get to the point where I see the need in the other? And that's, and we'll close with this, because I think this maybe is a different reading of the same text. Um, it may be, Art, that what he's talking about here is not, is not so much a directive as an observation. Once I am aware of the need of the other, how could I not act? Or if I fail to act, won't I necessarily feel like I'm sinning against him in some way? Right, like, that, like there's, a, there's a possibility of reading this as descriptive instead of prescriptive. Um, that, that what he's saying is there's a thing that happens inside of us. There's a thing that happened inside of Valerie that she saw this injured person and she couldn't keep going. And, and that what he's doing in this text, even though he's using this language of obligation and prescription, but really what he's doing in this text is he's naming that experience of radical humanity that says, once I see your need, I would sin against myself if I turned away from it. Um, so uh, I want to thank everyone. Thank you all for being here. I wish everyone a good day. And um, yeah, I'll see you all soon. Oh, thank you.